Good afternoon. How's the sound? Can everyone hear? Thank you. <clears throat> well, it is my pleasure to be here today, and um, I am pleased to be asked to be here, but as some of you have already uh, heard, I would not be here but for my longtime friend since first grade um, who serves on this committee, I think, and helps uh, put, help put this together. So I told her when she called to ask me, I could not say no. She knows too much on me, so I had to <laughs> comply. I have looked at some of the topics that you've been um, hearing this morning and some of the excellent speakers that you've had. I had an opportunity to stand in the back of the room for a few minutes and hear Austin make comments. And so I know that, that you understand that today is an important day for kind of self-evaluation and being able to listen to others about what you might do to improve yourself as well as uh, to be better employees and better staff support. So that being the topic of today, I wanted to just tell you that I want to speak just a few moments about my journey and um, it's, it's in large part no different than each of your individual journeys. As much as I would like to distill how to be your best self, I wish I could do it and just say, here are the three easy points. If you'll go out and do these three things, um, you'll be most successful. But the truth is, is that I think being your best self does require just constant and persistent reevaluation. You've got to be aware of yourself and have the ability to put to work the things that you know that work best for you. You are the most influential person that you will talk to all day long. Now think about that. You've heard excellent speakers this morning, but nobody can influence what you do more than yourself. In my court, I deal a lot with persons that are suffering from drug addictions. There's lots of things that we can do to try to help, but it's a common reference when we say, you really must decide for yourself that this is what you want to do, to become clean, come, become sober. So that's what I'd like for you to think about today, <clears throat> is that you have more influence on yourself than anyone else. So I'm gonna ask you this question. Are you filling yourself up with positivity or are you focusing on your perceived deficiencies? We all have negative thoughts from time to time, but I'll tell you that I think the best advice that I could give you and often have the opportunity to speak to young lawyers and to speak to, to young people in leadership classes a positive attitude is very, will put you on that road to success. A positive attitude doesn't mean that you're not gonna have the bumps in the road, but it's gonna give you what it takes to work through and over those bumps. Randy is my husband. <clears throat> he and I are members of a community volunteer group. This group is involved in beautification projects and generally, the promotion of quality of life issues in the small hometown we live in in Fulton, Mississippi. Now that may sound very vague. Here's what we actually do. Here's what we do versus what we say we're about. We meet the first Saturday of each month. The group meets in the park. We dispense from there. And with our shovels and rakes and weed eaters, we go clean ditches and we plant flowers and we clean sidewalks and we beautify town. During the month leading up to the work day, we plan what we're gonna do and we organize people. We attend board meetings and we volunteer for festivals. There's always a job to do and you know that. You know that you don't have to look but just up from your desk to know that there's another job to be done. But all of this, we feel, has made Fulton a better place to live and work. When we're organizing our group, we talked about our plans and our goals, but you know, finally what we decided to do was simply roll up our sleeves and go to work. We felt like before we could ask the city for financial support, 
or before we could ask people to come and give up a Saturday, they had to see demonstrated what this was about. So we just simply rolled up our sleeves five years ago and went to work one Saturday a month. Now why am I telling you this? What does this have to do with your staff development today? Well, it has a lot to do with it because I think you want to be leaders. You want to be leaders in your community. You want to be leaders at your job. You want to be leaders within your department. You want to be able to identify with others' problems. You want to identify with your community problems. We all can be leaders that will help our university, Mississippi State University, help our community, help Starkville, help the region as well as our state. We have the ability to fix the problems. What we need to do is just simply find that fire in our belly, that passion, and pursue it with gusto. The pursuit of your passions should be that same fire that you have with your career, with your work, with your home, with your family. And I know we have so many demands on us you do on a daily basis between family commitments, church, home, community, but we have to have the fire in our belly to really want to have the passion to do everything that we can do to make it wonderful. If I've learned anything, I've learned that things don't happen without direction. They happen because there is a leader or they happen because somebody is pushing, somebody is saying, stay focused, do this, stay focused. So I really wanna encourage you today to think of yourself as being that leader. How do you stay focused? How do you keep people focused? Well, I did not think of myself as a leader in high school, and it was not until college here at Mississippi State that I was placed in my first leadership role. I recall exactly where I was standing on first floor Hathorne dorm when I was asked to be president of my sorority. On countless occasions in later years, <clears throat> I have declared that being president of my sorority taught me more of life's lessons than any other job I ever had. I just didn't know how crazy young girls could be, myself included. So you know the challenges, rush, organizing campus activities, discipline members. You know that there are so many things to maintaining that good parent-student relationship if you're president of the organization, maintaining the relationship, a good relationship with your university. In addition, <clears throat> I had a unique opportunity, you could say, but what I perceived to be a real challenge because I was a country girl. I came from a community or town of 350 population. So I was leading a group of girls in a sorority that had much more privileged backgrounds than I. I was leading a group of girls that I'll assure you much smarter than I and came from most of them came from large and prestigious schools. And I graduated from high school in Tremont, and at that time we had the record-breaking class number of 30 graduating. So how could I lead these girls? How could I be in this position? But I want you to take that as an example of how a leader can be in unfamiliar circumstances or be in an environment unlike what you're accustomed to and still excel. And in a way, I think you excel better and differently because you bring something unique and different and you've seen it from the other side. But mainly, I think a lot of times when we aren't of that privileged group, or we have seen it from a different side, our first reaction is just do it. Just roll up our sleeves and just do it. And I think that is when, no matter your background, no matter 
your circumstances, just be that natural leader of just get it done. I was asked to focus on my personal history, as Judy says, my personal story, from college to the United States District Court, from law school to being a judge, and from young motherhood to being a grandmother of two of the most beautiful grandchildren you have ever seen in your life. And if you don't believe me, I do have photos here today. <laughs> I am always concerned that a discussion of my path and my career will seem boastful, and I don't mean it that way at all. But I do want to share with you in a way of encouraging us at each and every level about what we can do and how things happen in life. Try to be your best self on every day because my experience has been that good things can happen in life with hard work, dedication to task, some good luck, and I certainly have been blessed with some good luck and good timing, and preparation. And I want to talk a little bit about preparation in a moment. I hope you see it normal in your own life to have self-doubt as you sit there and go, sure, she's a United States District Court judge. Yes. Well, it didn't just happen. It happened over a very long period of time. I hope that I can share these thoughts with you for the proposition that we do not all get along the path at the same rate, the same speed, and we don't all even take the same path. But it doesn't mean that there, and far from it, is there just one path to success. You know what your perfect road is, and we figure that out for each and every one of us. Success does not have a single definition, and success itself is fluid. What you think is important today may not be important five years from now. What you perceive to be your road to success today may change as you change. I submit to you an important part of being your best self will be finding a work-life balance. That's been very difficult for me over the years, and it's only been when I've been able to really consciously focus on what part of my life belongs to family and home and what part of my life belongs in the courtroom. In 1980, I graduated from law school. I came home to Tremont, Mississippi, and I started practicing law in Fulton, about nine miles away from Tremont. I didn't know anything about practicing law, and I knew even less about how to make a living practicing law. And there's a huge distinction between making a living doing what you're doing and just doing it. After my son was born in 1983, I became a sole practitioner in Fulton. I enjoyed a good practice, made a decent living, earned, learned a whole lot of things, including I had to learn how to practice law. If you think coming out of law school after three years teaches you how to practice law, you're wrong. It does not. It prepares you to go learn how to practice law. But I would do it all over again, just as it has happened in my life. It is impossible to define the two or three things that one must do to be successful. As I indicated when we started, I wish today I could tell you do these three easy things and you'll have success in your life. But regardless of your position in your department, regardless of your position here on campus, I believe preparation is one of the most important. Plus being able to prepare one's self for a job or an interview, a task. I think the importance of the concept is that preparation puts it squarely on your shoulders. It's not somebody else's job, it's not somebody else's responsibility, it's not somebody else's interview. It's your interview, so you have to prepare if you're going to excel. My family, and I know, I've always done what I call, I've always run scared. I've run scared all of my life. 
Since my days as being president of that sorority, I have understood very plainly that I'm not the smartest, the cutest, I'm not the best writer on our court, I'm not the most articulate, but I am, while I'm not the best at anything, I will out-prepare all of you. My lawyers that come in the courtroom understand. I've read their briefs. I've read the cases behind their briefs, and I know the strengths and the weaknesses of their lawsuit before they ever step foot in the courtroom. That's being prepared. That's how I got by all these years with not being the smartest, the cutest, the most articulate. So I submit to you that all of you can prepare. You can be your best self. Today it means a lot of different things because life has a lot of demands and it means a lot of things in your individual jobs, but you can be your best self. That reminds me of a story that I have shared a lot, a number of times, about personal responsibility and putting it on your shoulders. It's a story about a young Methodist preacher assigned to a rural church. The church was in bad and needed repairs. It needed painting. The roof was falling in. The windows were broken out. And this young minister worked day and night making the repairs. In the Methodist Church, we have bishops, and the bishop came to visit. Upon seeing the beautifully repaired church, he proclaimed, isn't it amazing what God has done? And the young minister said, yes, but you should have seen, seen this church when God had it all by himself. So we do, we have to make the difference for ourselves, and you gotta do your part to be successful. My first opportunity in public service was an unsolicited offer to fill the unexpired term of Etowah County prosecuting attorney. In April of 1984, Frank Russell went on the circuit court bench by gubernatorial appointment, and he walked to my office. I had a client in my office. He opened the door, and he did like this, come with me, <clears throat> and like a horse leading to water, I walked, leave my client, walk out the door and I said, what are we doing? And he said, the Etiwama County Board of Supervisors is about to appoint you as prosecuting attorney. Scared to death, running scared, we walk across the street. Just before we walk in the Board of Supervisors office, he turns to me and he says, don't ask what it pays. <laughs> but the retirement is real good. I had been practicing all of four years and four months. I didn't know the word retirement was in the dictionary yet. And I was doing well to work hard to pay my utility bills. So yes, what was described, the Mississippi Code by statute as a part-time job turned out to be a full-time job in addition to my regular practice. But on more than one occasion, I have proclaimed that my experiences as a prosecuting attorney was probably one of the best life experiences that I ever had. I would never have sought that job because I would not have felt at that time that I had the adequate knowledge, skills, or experience. That job taught me a lot of things. People are watching what you do and people size up your ability before you size up your own ability. If we waited on the right time, or if we waited until we had enough experience, we would wait forever. I learned that you can learn a lot when you have to. When you have to work quickly on your feet, when you have to figure out how to interview, cross-examine, talk to witnesses, you can do it. And so that's an example of many that I've had in my life where I was placed in a position that turned out to be a wonderful experience for me, but I'd have never sought that position because I didn't think I was qualified. Having a small child, and I bet most of you in this room have children, but having a small child and having a full-time career is difficult, and all of you experience that balancing, that juggling. 
But I have often told young female lawyers, particularly, that I am confident that they will be more harshly judged at the pearly gates for being a bad parent than they will for being a bad librarian or a bad secretary. Children come first. In our lives and in our practices, we know the importance of setting priorities. But I think we have to understand and learn how to juggle. Today, I'm in a home with no small children other than those grandchildren when they come to visit. But even in a home now with no children to raise, rear, I still find times that Randy understands that I've got a trial starting on Monday and 100% of my time, my effort, my thought, my energy is geared toward getting ready to try that case. It's reading those briefs. But there's other times when we can kind of take the foot off the throttle and enjoy life. And so learning how to balance that and when you gear up and apply yourself 110% and when you can back off and make family a priority is certainly doable. It takes work. During my years in private practice, I made it a point to be very involved in community. I continue to be very involved in community, church. But I also, during my young practicing years, I, I made a point to get involved in some bar activities. Here in the hills and further north in Fulton, Tremont, and Etiwama County, it's even more so than in Octavia County. But it's a long way to Jackson, Mississippi. And so um, I served on the Board of Bar Commissioners, and I literally was the token. Out of 17, I was the only female. I was the only sole practitioner. And I was one of a handful that didn't live in Jackson, Mississippi, or Ridgeland, or Madison. I was the country girl from the northern part of the county that they were pleased to have so they could say, yes, we have a female, and yes, we have a sole practitioner versus coming at being involved in a large firm. Never, those trips were long. Martin, my son, made a lot of them. His parents, grandparents, lived in Jackson, and I would buckle him in and take them to, him to grandparents' house, and I'd go to my meetings and so forth. But I never understood what I was giving. I never understood the, the money I was putting into the bank while I was participating in those bar activities until I ran for circuit court judge and later when I went through the confirmation process to find that those years, that, those, that hard time of getting up at the crack of dawn and driving to Jackson really paid off. So I want you to think about the things that are hard, the things that you really don't want to do in your job or in your profession, in your career, within one of your industry associations. But I want to encourage you that that's money in the bank for later use, for advancement of your career. I had never considered running for political office. I had certainly not considered running for circuit court judge. But I made that decision in 2002 to seek a post in a hotly contested um, first judicial district um, contest, hotly contested. Um, I ended up winning a slot. There were three vacant, there were three seats to be had filled with three incumbents and I knocked one of the incumbents out to become one of the circuit court judges for the first judicial district. Now, I'll tell you again what I told you about becoming a prosecuting attorney, what I know that every one of you can say for your own lives. Right then and there, I didn't think I had the experience to do it. I knew I didn't have the experience to do it. I'd never been a judge. I did not think I had the ability to do it. But lawyers persisted that I make this, um, this campaign run. So being elected as circuit court judge, taught me a number of things. People are watching what you do, and people size up your ability long before you size up your ability. People know, and you know, that if you waited 
to the right time, you'd be waiting forever. If you waited until you had enough experience to ask for that promotion, you'd be waiting forever. I learned that you can do a lot of things that you have to do when you have to do it. And I learned so very much about the art of campaigning. I learned to how to campaign. It's for the first time in your life that you have to not sell a product, not sell a warranty deed or a deed of trust in the law practice, but you had to sell yourself. And so it was an opportunity for me to see that in this world, in the First Judicial District of Mississippi, and I think it's true all over Mississippi and for the most part our nation, people care. People care about their elected officials. I also learned that some people could care less. They did not know that there was a circuit court judge even in the race to be elected. So these are things that you learn that make you better equipped to prepare for the next challenge. I want to um, tell you that I thoroughly enjoyed my tenure on the circuit court bench. I've alluded to the fact that it was rough, tough, hard fought, only woman in the race, and it was not pleasant. Um, a lot of money was spent on all sides, but we had a good first four years, and so I did not have an opponent in my second term. Another door opened for me in 2007 when I was nominated and subsequently confirmed as being the first female Article III federal judge in the state of Mississippi. Now, most states had a female federal judge at the point that I was confirmed in 2007. In fact, I'll tell you at the confirmation hearing, the female senator from state of Texas was sitting about three rows down, about three seats down from Senator Trent Lott. And Trent Lott gets up to make the introduction and says, this will be our first uh, female Article III judge in the state of Mississippi. And she had a hot mic and she said, and it's about time. <laughs> it was an interesting, interesting experience and I wish I could put into words the excitement of being considered um, as a potential nominee. The entire process encompassed the fear of the unknown. And really, it's a very secretive process, I guess is what I would call it. Certainly seemed that way to me at the time. But just to give you an idea about how that process works, the Senate Judiciary Committee takes very seriously the background checks that they do on judges. Now, I say Article III, and that means nothing to any of you, so let me explain. An Article III judge is a lifetime appointment. So I have my, ju I have my job as a federal judge until I die. Well, the FBI utilized four agents to cover every place that I had ever lived including Mississippi State. And when they asked me where I lived on campus, I, I said, Hathorne Dorm, and what room number? I couldn't remember the room number. So after weeks, literally, of um, people here on campus willing to go back into the archives, they found that I lived in room 123, which now I'll never forget. But of course, as lawyers, we keep up with time. Uh, that's how we get paid, that's how we bill. But I, the, because I was so conscious about keeping up with time, I can tell you that the questionnaire that I filled out, the instructions for filling out the questionnaire was 77 pages of instructions. <clears throat> it took three of us 156 hours to complete all of the information, which was basically who do you know? Who, was, who were your neighbors? Who were your sweet mates at Mississippi State? Because the FBI is going to contact those people and ask them questions. I was asked every place I had ever lived, two people who could verify that I had lived there, and their addresses as well. And these are people I'd not had contact with for 25 plus years, and you've got to run down sweet mates and explain to them that the FBI is going to call them. 
the FBI interviewed 88 people in Fulton alone, um, including judges, attorneys, ministers, bankers, uh, people on the street. I just, I just never imagined under any circumstances that my life would be reviewed under this microscope. It was much like seeing a movie in slow motion, as if you had gone back in time and you're seeing everything that you did or said, God forbid, did. And it was from college life. I had a good time in college. <laughs> up and through the last days of Sunday going to church, they reviewed all my bank records. Every aspect was under a microscope. Well, I can't stand here and tell you that I was entirely comfortable with that process. How would you want somebody to come look at every judgment you'd ever made? You decide to do go to Mississippi State versus going to Ole Miss. That's a judgment call. Was that a good, fair, right judgment? There were lots of um, very microscopic digging into the vetting process. I realized the decisions and the judgments that I had made in the past could not be undone. So think about that slow moving movie that you're about to see every judgment you've ever made or decision that you ever made in your life and there's nothing from out here that you can do to go back and change it. It was very scary. I likened it to reading my obituary my interview at the White House <clears throat> was very aggressive and hostile in this climate that we're in politically. Maybe you can understand if I tell you this. I'm a country girl from Tremont, Mississippi. I have no clue what it's like to be invited to the West Wing of the White House to be interviewed by a panel of 13, 14 Department of Justice attorneys. I did not realize, I did not realize, <clears throat> because this is ignorance on my part, but I did not realize that the Judiciary Committee at the time was composed of the majority Democrat. I was nominated by President Bush. So I did not understand that this process was not supposed to happen. I did not understand I was being sent to the slaughter just to see, just to say, we entertained your nominee. We looked at her, it's unacceptable. I didn't understand that that's how that worked or was supposed to work. So at the White House, um, I was asked a number of questions, but I'll focus on the um, illegal drugs and prescription drug question. He pulls out a piece of paper and there's 56, 70, 56, 58 question, uh, list of medications. Have you ever taken this, 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 and this? And I was asked, did you ever smoke marijuana? And I said, no, and I hadn't. And I denied use of marijuana as well as denied use of the prescription drug list. Most of those names, I didn't know what they were anyway. And when the interview is complete, the guy looks at me and he said, let's just get this straight. You're in college in the 70s and you didn't smoke marijuana? And I said, I didn't, I didn't, but let me tell you why I didn't. At which point he thought I was about to give the Bill Clinton, I did not inhale line. And he says, I don't want to hear it. And I said, well, my explanation is that my father would follow me out to the car every Sunday when I left to come back to Mississippi State. I'd roll the window down, he'd stick his finger in my face and say, do not use drugs. Do not. Didn't say anything about drinking a Miller Lite, but do <laughs> not use drugs. And it stuck because he threatened me that I would, he'd pull me out of school, I'd come home. I was having a good time in college. I wanted to stay. So I managed to comply with that parental demand. So I've said on a many, many occasions, what did I learn from this experience? Well, I learned as parents that we give and should give our kids very clear and definite instructions and we should say it often. We should repeat it because it worked. 
I didn't do the thing that my father commanded that I not do. And the other thing that I learned out of that White House interview experience is you will be held accountable for everything you do. You will be held accountable for every decision that you make and no maybe, you don't go through a Senate confirmation process, but there'll be an interview, there'll be a promotion, there will be something where somebody's gonna ask some questions and you will be held accountable. So, based on my strenuous vetting process and eventual confirmation that I might add, turns out to be surprising to everybody, but there were no opposition votes in the Senate, I can say that I learned the following. Our actions are important. What we do and don't do is being watched by others. We need to be our best every single day and let people see us at our best because people are sizing us up long before we size ourselves up. All shortcuts and dishonest tricks eventually are seen for what they are. And I learned there's many good ways over my lifetime to make a good, honest living and to do it honestly. I think that we should all strive to be the parent your children will be proud of, be the spouse that your husband or wife will be proud of, will respect and appreciate. I've always said, be as kind to the janitor as you are the CEO. A good support team at home and, a work, and at work is important, but those relationships must be fed and they must be nurtured. You're not the only one taking here. You've got to give. Always remember work ethic, honesty and integrity, dedication to tasks, perseverance, good positive attitude, but one I think that goes further than anything is gratitude. Be thankful. Our values are reflected in every single, th every single thing we do. Things that you don't even think are important in this day, tomorrow, last week. Set your values, and they're important. They're being watched. Integrity counts. I encourage these young lawyers that I speak to, they will be challenged so many times over the course of their careers with less than ethical request walk away. Do the best you can every single day. Every task you undertake, no matter how your perception of how minimal it is, that you're just a little tiny part of the operation here at Mississippi State University, but if you don't do your little part, then something else gets out of whack on the wheel. Everybody's job all the time is important. Do your best at it. And every day, somebody will take notice. I encourage you, as I go back to our Fulton Community Volunteer Group, just roll up your sleeves and do it. Just go do it. Pursue your dreams with fire in your belly. Pursue your dreams in your community, your dreams at work, your career advancements. And the one thing I would leave with you is prepare, prepare, prepare. Be your best self every day and others will notice. Thank you 